Welcome to this episode of the John Henry Weston Show. May God bless you. We are really pleased to bring you tonight Dr. Taylor Marshall, who many of you know. Stay tuned. It's going to be absolutely fascinating. Taylor Marshall, good to be with you. Hey, it's great to be with you, John Henry. Let's start as we always do with the sign of the cross. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, we're with Taylor Marshall, who, for those of you who might not know him, he's a fantastic Catholic theologian, a professor, and a real, well, I'd like to say, doctor of the faith. Um, Taylor Marshall is... Uh, probably most known because of his YouTube work. He's got thousands, in fact, tens of thousands of fans on YouTube who have learned uh, from his instruction. Now, he's just written a book, and I think that's where we're going to start. Taylor, your book called Infiltration, it really struck me. Um, let me go to the background of that a little bit. You, Why did you write this? Why did you publish it now uh, at this point in the history of the church and through Sophia Press? Well, you know, I'm a I'm a convert to the Catholic faith, and uh, I came. I was previously an Episcopalian cleric, and uh, just studying the Catholic faith, studying her faith, studying her morals. I was drawn to the magisterium of the Catholic Church that was consistent, that was perennial. It was a rock. It was a bedrock on which to rest our faith in Jesus Christ, and so. You know, I left the Episcopal Church, I left the Episcopal priesthood, and I came into the Catholic Church. And, you know, the the interesting thing about it is, you know, the Anglican Church, the Church of England, originally began because of Henry VIII and this question of divorce and remarriage. That was at the very root of that tradition. And so I was leaving that tradition and coming to the Catholic faith that's never changed and has this very strong teaching on the sanctity of marriage, the sacramentality of marriage. And so it's been sort of shocking in the last several years to be a Catholic, to be a convert, and to see what seems to be some changes that are going on in the church. And so this led me into a long-term study of why it is that the Catholic church seems to have in the recent years, and I would argue even in the last few decades, has undergone um, weakness, uh, perceived changes. Of course, the Catholic Church and, and the Catholic faith can never change, but there can be infiltrations and there can be confusions, as we've seen in the history of the church from, you know, whether it's Gnosticism, Arianism, Nestorianism, the Monophysite heresy, you name it. There's always sort of been these heretical movements that over time are corrected and clarified through the papacy and through the councils. And so I began this study trying to understand the current crisis. And a lot of people say, you know, well, it goes back to Bennett the 16th resigning in 2013, or it goes back to Paul the sixth, or it goes back to Vatican II, or John the 23rd. And as I began to study this issue, I realized it actually goes back a lot longer than just a few decades or even 50 years. And in my studies, I found that it really began in the 1830s, 1840s, with an infiltration of uh, humanist, secular ideals um, of people conspiring to not attack the church from the outside, like Nero had or Diocletian or even Napoleon, but to subtly attack the church from the inside, an infiltration. And that's what's unique about our time. Pius X said modernism is the synthesis of all heresies. And so what we've seen is an internal corruption, an internal infiltration, which ultimately will fail by the grace of God. The Holy Spirit will overcome this. So we've the name of the book is Infiltration, uh, the plot to destroy the church from within. And uh, it, it basically tracks, uh, begins with the permanent instruction of the Alta Vendita in the 1840s and also the apparition of Our Lady of La Salette and goes all the way up through Pius IX, Leo XIII, Pius X, Fatima, Vatican II, John pa Paul VI, John Paul II, Benedict, and then, of course, uh, the current situation with Pope Francis. So, in a way, it's a history book. It, it brings you up to date with everything that has happened in the past 150 years. And then, as you read it, you begin to understand that's 
why we are in the crisis we are experiencing right now. Absolutely. I was totally fascinated by your book. Uh, very privileged to be one of the first ones to review it. Um, and what I loved about it, I think I described it to to other people as uh, something very generous. It, it's like a professor, when a professor teaches you something, you can learn after many, many years his actual take on things, because they normally don't give that to you all at one sitting. Uh, normally, uh, you know, and you actually did that. I, I thought it was a very generous thing to do. You you give your take on things to readers uh, in a way that people can take years and years to do. If you say, you know, sit through their classes and so on, but you didn't. Uh, you didn't make them do that. You were very generous. You gave the sweep of history so that people, uh, really lay people, when it comes to this kind of thing, uh, could didn't have to study all these things for so long. You did the study. You gave of your study. It was incredibly generous. Um, but I wanted to focus on something in the book that you had already mentioned. It was the Alta Vendita. What is it for people who've never heard of it before? And, uh, you know, how significant it is. I know that some of the popes already talked about it. So what is the Alta Vendita? So the, the, the document is called the Permanent Instruction, the Alta Vendita. This, this document was um, acquired by the church, uh, Pope Pius IX and Leo XIII saw it as authentic and asked for it to be reproduced in the mid to late 1800s. And it's it's written by the leader of the Carbonari. The Carbonari were the Italian version of the Freemasons. I know when people hear Freemasons, they think this is conspiracy and loony and all that. But if Freemasons or Carbonari, Carbonari means like the coal burners, um, if that makes you uncomfortable, just think secular humanists, right? Secular humanist ideals. All religions are true. Um, the earth is divine. Pantheism. All of these ideas that basically you hear from uh, Oprah Winfrey and Dr. Phil and UN documents. This is the secular humanist worldview. And those who believed it met in secret societies um, because in the 1700s and the 1800s to say these kind of things out loud would get you in trouble. You'd lose your job, you might lose your life. So they met in secret, these secret societies, and we call them Freemasonic societies or the Carbonari. Um, you know, these are the groups that were meeting in Europe and also in the new world a little bit um, to introduce secular humanist ideals, uh, democracy, uh, brotherhood of man, um, disestablished, the Catholic Church against monarchy, etc. So, these guys wrote a document called the Permanent Instruction of Alta, Alta Vendita, and in that document they say, you know, look, we have tried for centuries to attack the Catholic Church. You kill their bishops, you kill their holy people, you kill their popes, and they just make them into martyrs. They they build altars, they build shrines, they build basilicas and cathedrals over the tombs of these martyrs, and that's not an effective strategy. So the new strategy moving forward in the mid-1800s is to infiltrate from the inside. They said, we're never going to get a pope who's going to just renounce the faith, who's going to come to a Carbonari sect meeting. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to spend 100 years or more, they say this in the Alta Vendita, over 100 years, and we will begin to corrupt the clergy, the religious, the seminaries, and the young people so that over time, their mind will be secular humanist, given to the ideals that we promote, without them ever having to go to a, a Freemasonic lodge, right? It'll be in the schools. It'll be in the seminaries. And over time, this document states that eventually we will get priests who believe the way we believe, not the traditional Catholic way. We'll get bishops who believe secular humanist ideals. We'll get cardinals. And eventually we will elect a pope in our own image. The document says a pope after our own heart. It's a revolution in Tierra and Cope. Tierra is the old crown that the Pope wore and the Cope, right? The, the vestment, the cape. So the, the permanent instruction of Alta Mendita sets this whole plan uh, into motion. And when the Popes find out about it, they're horrified, they publish it. But in a way, it's too late because it's already begun to happen in the 1800s. Leo XIII sees demons settling on Rome he writes the St. Michael prayer. He writes the St. Michael exorcism. And from then on, uh, the church has been fighting this, this internal corruption of philosophy, theology, morals, and liturgy. 
So right now, um, in, in terms of things seem like, you know, they seem like such a boogeyman, Freemasonry doesn't exist. Um, but we have, um, we've seen it, as you said, in, in secular humanism. But uh, what about this co- thing called the St. Gallen Mafia? What, what is that all about? Sure. So you, you mentioned the Freemasons and everyone's like, oh, the Freemasons, you know, they help hospitals and, you know, give out candy at parades and things. Yeah. I mean, today the Freemasons are more of a joke, but remember the Freemasons were secret societies in the early 1800s. Now their thinking has pretty much permeated society. You know, you don't have to be a Freemason to think the way Voltaire thought hundreds of years ago. So in a way they've been successful. And in my book, I show that the, the Freemasonic ideals were eventually turned into a religion by Aleister Crowley. Aleister Crowley was an Englishman. He was a, a Swiss mountaineer. And he took the Freemasonic ideas and he created a what he calls a Gnostic Catholic Church, Ecclesia Catholica Gnostica, the Gnostic Catholic Church. He writes a Gnostic Mass, which is based on magic and the occult. And he also develops a system of sex magic. That's right, sex magic um, that takes the the adherents higher and higher in the occult, in in magic and in perversion. And Aleister Crowley established this Catholic Church. And what was interesting is, is eventually the Gnostic Catholic Church, as I show in the book Infiltration, eventually makes its capital, its holy see, if you will, um, right outside and near St. Gallen, Switzerland. And what's interesting about that is we have Theodore McCarrick, the defrocked cardinal, ex-cardinal. Uh, he found his vocation at St. Gallen. Uh, and then we also have the St. Gallen Mafia, which is a group of cardinals and bishops and archbishops who are meeting in that region uh, and discussing ways in which to select the next pope after John Paul II or after uh, eventually after Bennett the 16th and their their number one candidate we know from their own admission was uh, Arch uh, Cardinal Bergoglio who becomes Pope Francis so it's it's really interesting to see this Freemasonic idea turn into a church find a place in Switzerland St. Gallen and then this mafia to develop and deliver to us uh, what seems to be a revolution in Cope and Tierra as we read in in the permanent instruction of Alta Vendita. Now, you certainly, it certainly seems to be a revolution indeed, but just so that our viewers know that you're not using like pejorative language, you're not making up the language of the St. Gallen Mafia. Where did that term actually come from? Yeah. Cardinal Daniels. Um, he's the one who used the term mafia. They, they use two terms. They use some, uh, the St. Gallen club or the St. Gallen mafia, but these aren't terms that we created. These are terms that they themselves have used and they and they've had to run a little bit of defense here and they've tried to clean up uh, and not use those terms and, and maybe deny it but they definitely were meeting in St. Gallen which by the way was the capital for the European conferences for bishops which is another uh, unusual element um to this whole story but yeah they were they were definitely working on the vision of Cardinal Mart- uh of Martini who was in Milan uh Cardinal uh Martini was, um, I'm sorry, was it Milan? Was Martini Milan or Venice? I just, yeah, Milan, yeah. Uh, Cardinal Martini was was opposed to John Paul II, uh, certainly uh, Cardinal Ratzinger, and he wanted to see a new church in which Humanae Vitae was overturned, where there was women's ordination, um, where there was an increased sensitivity to ecumenism, uh, and basically uh, seeing all religions on the same footing, all all aspiring to the transcendent uh, and taking the reforms of the Second Vatican Council to the next level, you know, to to Kuhn and, and, and those sort of more radical um, expressions that were that were in float in the spirit of Vatican II. So Cardinal Martini was very enthusiastic about that. And in, in, in that group, the St. Gallen Mafia was trying to figure out how to uh, prevent a Cardinal Ratzinger and put in someone who would be in the mold of of Cardinal martini and and i think you and i both think and i think probably most people listening realize that 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 pope is cardinal bergoglio who we know as pope francis now 
So now we have this sort of, uh, with this history, your fantastic book, which really lays it out. Um, and they can see where, you know, in the past we've come from and how we got to the present and how sort of we got here. And by the way, Bishop Schneider uh, was the one who um, did the intro to your book. Absolutely fascinating. So we see this, uh, we Catholics, what are we to do now? Here we have this situation where the faith seems to be being dismantled from within, as you say. Um, What's the best route for Catholics to take right now? What can we do? Yeah, I mean, infiltration, when you read it, it's it's one of the most, you know, red-pilled and, in a way, discouraging books that you're going to read in 2019 or maybe in the last several years. It's it's extremely discouraging because the, the blinders come off and you see what's been going on in the Catholic Church. Everyone who was told everything under John Paul II is great, we're winning back the church, the new younger vocations are awesome, everything is going to be great, you know, from the 80s and the 90s forward— Suddenly, when the summer of shame happened and Cardinal McCarrick was was unmasked, everybody realized that this 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 narrative was a sham, and that there's deep, deep problems in the Catholic Church, and currently with the cardinals and the inner circle of the cardinals, and with Pope Francis. So that's a reality. But the ending of infiltration, I think, is is the most optimistic message that you can. So if you just stopped reading and and didn't read the last two chapters, you'd be like, man, this is a bummer of a book to read. But when you get to the end, you get to what do we do next? What is the answer? I'm an optimist, John Henry. I I believe that the Catholic Church is going to come out of this like a phoenix from the ashes, and we are going to enter into a great period of church history because we're going to get clarity on so many things. For example, on the teaching on the sacrament of matrimony. It's going to become very clear in the decades and perhaps centuries to come. What do we do next? John Henry, you and I are laymen. I know there's probably priests and maybe some bishops and cardinals watching, but you and I are laymen. Our lady came down. She got off her throne in 1917 and came down to earth. And she performed the miracle of the sun. And she gave all these these apparitions and messages to the children and the seers at Fatima. And she told us to pray the rosary. The rosary is a meditation on the life and mysteries and the death and the redemption and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I just got back from the Holy Land uh, three days ago, and I realized when I was there, because I went I went to where the Annunciation happened and the visitation and the nativity and the presentation and the agony in the garden and Golgotha and all of these places, the Church of the Dormition, all these places that I've read about in the Bible and prayed on the rosary, I was physically there, and I realized you don't have to go to Jerusalem to experience all these. I was experiencing these geographic places and the mysteries associated with them in those beads, praying those beads. I was going to the Annunciation. I was going to the Visitation. I was going to the Nativity every single day on those beads. And you realize the gift that Our Lady gave St. Dominic wasn't just saying Hail Mary over and over and over. It was these profound mysteries that are biblical that we meditate on. So I think we're called as laity to rebuild the church and and rebuilding the church means returning to the traditional norms of Catholicism, going to confession every two weeks or every month, uh, rediscovering the liturgy, the traditional forms of the liturgy. Um, You know, I'm a huge believer in the traditional Latin mass, Um, the novenas, the fast days, you know, Lent is not just about giving up chocolate. Lent is about entering into a spirit of penance. So I think Catholics are beginning to rediscover and ask the questions, what does it mean to be a Catholic? What did our grandparents and our great grandparents and the great great grandparents do that sanctified the church and, and made us, I mean, proud is probably the wrong word, but made us excited about being the one true church of Jesus Christ. Right. So that's how we're going to do it. We're lay people. Right. We build it, you know, just brick by brick. We can't preach sermons. We can't say mass. We can't hear confessions. We can't confirm. We can't consecrate basilicas. We're here with our Bible in one hand and our beads in the other hand. But that is worth something. We're the foot soldiers. Right. These prayers matter and our lady will lead us. And I think this this conference coming up in in uh, in Rome is another example of just pious lay people coming together praying and talking. 
Beautiful. That's the October 4th upcoming conference in Rome, a roundtable with Dr. Taylor Marshall, with Michael Matt from the Remnant, Michael Voris from the Vortex and Church Militant, Professor De Matte from Rome as well. Um, also, uh, Marco Tozzati, famous uh, uh, Vatican reporter in Rome as well. It's going to be a great time. Taylor Marshall, that's all the time we have uh, for, for, uh, for the show today. I look forward to seeing you in Rome, my friend. May God bless you and may God bless you all. Thanks for joining us on this episode of the John Henry Weston Show. We'll see you next time.